But as I said, we're going to be in John 11, and I'm going to read today a lengthy portion of Scripture, uh, just this, this long passage, but it's really uh, an interesting passage. It's one of the most, I think, one of the more interesting narratives in all of Scripture, um, let alone just the book of John. We've been working our way through the book of John. If you weren't here, we kind of went through John all fall and then uh, did some different stuff for Christmas, and then we did 21 days of prayer, and now we're jumping back into John, and we'll be here for a while. We're not going to follow each and every verse in the book of John for a little bit, because if we did that, we'd get to Easter and kind of be at a strange place in John, so I'm going to jump ahead in the book of John when it gets to be Easter time, and you'll understand when we get there. But uh, we're working through this, and, and this passage is, is, is truly a fascinating passage, a very interesting passage, and we find it in, in John 11, 1 through 57. And if you want to follow along, you can read it there. We'll probably have it on the screen as well. But it's about a man named Lazarus you've probably heard of. And it says, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who had anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. For it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going to go there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant he was taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we might die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, She went and she met him, but Mary remained in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give it to you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe in this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and she called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose and quickly went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her, When he saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her were also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of a blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there there will be an odor, for, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, 
Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they might believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who died came out, and his hands and feet were bound with linen strips, and his face was wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered and uh, gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. Nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not, the whole, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not only for the nation only, but, for, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but, from, but went from there to the region near the wilderness, to a town called Ephraim, and there he stayed with the disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think? That he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, He should let them know so that they might arrest him. So an interesting passage of scripture. Many of you are familiar with uh, the commentary written by Matthew Henry, right? Uh, It's one of the first ones many of us probably ever experienced as a Bible commentary. And and, uh, Matthew, in his, Mr. Henry, in his commentary, uh, says something to the effect of, of Jesus had to say it this way. He had to say, Lazarus, come out. Because if he had simply just said that day, come out, then all of the dead would have come forth. And that's an interesting take. Uh, I I remember reading that from him. And and today uh, we do come to another one of Jesus' signs. And the book of John has all of these signs. And if you're keeping score at home, we're at sign number seven so far in the book of John. And and it is perhaps the most spectacular of the the signs that Jesus performs throughout this book. Uh, He's gone, Jesus and his guys have gone kind of east. uh, They're they're east of the Jordan River. He's left Jerusalem. And and he's gone to this place that John had already described way back in John 1.28. It's the same, same area, same place, same region where John the Baptist was doing his preaching and doing doing the baptisms that he was doing there in the River Jordan. And, And Jesus has left because... They had just tried to stone him, right? So they were trying to already kill him at this point. Uh, at the end of chapter 10, he, he'd left and he's gone to this place. And, and when he gets there, it's, it's as if the, uh, kind of like the memories of John the Baptist and the work that he had done and all of those things ha- ha- have kind of come bubbling up. And at this time in the timeline, uh, John the Baptist had already been executed. He was beheaded, if you don't remember that story. And, uh, but the memories of, of, of him bringing the word there and, and discipling people and, and, and turning people towards Jesus uh, was still there. And there was still kind of this, this uh, movement underway in that area, the memories of his preaching and whatnot. And, and so Jesus and his, his team kind of come there, and, and they discover that as they get there, there's a, a great number of people in this area who had come to believe in, in Jesus. And so that's kind of what we discovered at the very end of John 10, that, that kind of this, this sort of revival had broken out into this area. And then now when we jump into John 11, we see Jesus coming back. He's actually coming back towards Jerusalem in the neighborhood of Jerusalem, again to this place called Bethany. It's just east, a little bit down the road from Jerusalem, and, and it's precariously close if those people in Jerusalem had recently just tried to execute you, right? You'd you, you think you don't really want to go wandering too close to this place, but uh, that is nonetheless where, where Jesus decides to go. 
And so he's uh, heading this direction, and he comes to this home of his dearest friends, Mary and, and Martha and Lazarus in our story. And, and as he does that, we see in the story today some unusual, unusual things. We're going to see, and you'll see these in your sermon notes, uh, that there's going to be an unusual love, an unusual joy, and an unusual sympathy from Jesus. Because here's the thing we find as we study the Bible and as we read Scripture. We see time and time and time again that, that Jesus does things differently than, than we might expect, right? But if you'll follow Him, you'll see that, that His unexpected ways are always better than anything we could have ever imagined. So let's dig in on that first one. Uh, First of all, there's this unusual love that we see exhibited by Jesus. The chapter opens with this story that that Lazarus is sick, right? And we're given a little glimpse into something that's going to come up in chapter 12. Lazarus is living with his two sisters, Mary and Martha, and and, and there's this beautiful story at the beginning of chapter 12 that we'll come to next week uh, that kind of picks up there. And their home is in Bethany, and they're basically within walking distance, a couple of miles from Jerusalem. You may remember your stories from the Bible back in Luke 10, the one where, where Mary's like sitting at Jesus' feet listening to his Bible study, right? And, and Jesus is, 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 is teaching and whatever, and, and Martha's in the kitchen, and you can just imagine Martha in that story, like her hair's all wild, and there's flour everywhere, and she's been working in the kitchen, right? And she kind of got her hands on her hips, and she comes walking up and says like, well, really, Mary? Like, like you could have at least helped. I'm in there working, I'm in there cooking, and you're out here just sitting doing nothing, right? She's like complaining about her sister, and... That, that story in Luke 10 is probably like two years before this story happens. And in those years, in that interim time, Jesus has really become close with this family. He's become friends with Mary and, and Martha and, and Lazarus, right? And uh, so, so, so they, the Bible is very clear that this is a, a friendly bond. It goes beyond just simply him discipling them. He, he, he likes them. He wants to be around them and spend time with them. It's, maybe, he, maybe as he would go to the temple, you know, he'd come and visit Jerusalem for fests and festivals. Maybe he'd stay there with them. Uh, we don't know. It doesn't tell us that. But, but nonetheless, we do know that he's friends and he enjoys their company, that they were close friends. And then look at verse 3. It says, the one that you love there, right? Which is speaking about Lazarus. And then in in verse 5 it says, Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus. Now, of course, Jesus loves all of us. That's a universal, absolute truth. But I think it's speaking here in a little bit different way, more of an intimate, family-friendly. We were, he loves them, and he knows them in in such a way. And then Jesus says something in verse 4 that, is very uh, interesting, I think. The disciples hear it as good news, but they don't hear what he is actually saying. In verse 4, he says about Lazarus, he's, you know, he gets told that he's sick, but he says, well, this sickness, it it doesn't lead to death, right? So so the disciples are like, all right, yeah, Lazarus isn't going to die. That's not quite really what, what Jesus was meaning at that point. Jesus was meaning something actually quite different, that even though he was going to die, that Lazarus was going to live again. That, that Lazarus's death would not be the ultimate result of his sickness. And then in verses 5 and verses 6, something really unusual happens. When he, when he hears that Lazarus is sick, right? The Bible tells us that he stays two more days. Did you catch that? Uh, in the Greek, there's this word that's frequently found in Scripture, and it's translated in English as the therefore. And we, we talk about this therefore in Bible study on Wednesdays a lot. What's the therefore, therefore, right? Why is it there? And so, so Jesus hears that, that Lazarus is sick, and therefore, he stays two more days. And it's like, that's an odd response to finding out your best pal and one of your best friends is sick, right? It's a little bit of an unusual thing to do. It doesn't quite seem to make sense. This isn't the response we would expect out of Jesus. Jesus, that guy that you really love, that guy that you really like, one of your best, best pals, right? He's sick. What you gonna do? Eh, I'll stay here for two more days, right? Uh, It doesn't quite make sense. And and normally, you would think, oh yeah, he's, he's, oh, my buddy's sick. I better go visit him, right? Or call him on the cell phone. I'll I'll send him a text message or something. Like, send him a note. Do something, Jesus. Don't stay here for two, what? 
what's this two more days thing you're doing? That's not what you do. If somebody you love is sick, you drop everything and you go, you, you, you go and you visit them, right? And the one, the one that he loves is sick, therefore he stays for two more days. Now the traditional interpretation of this goes that, that, that Jesus delayed for two days as an act of love because it glorified Jesus in a greater way. And, and, and that, that indeed, I think, is absolutely, without question, 100% true. Because as uh, Lazarus would have been dead by the time he actually gets there, four days now, he's going to show something that he otherwise could not have done had he not done it in this unexpected way. Now you have to understand a little cultural background about the Jews. There's, there was a superstition among the Jews that, that the soul or spirit could hang around for three days after somebody's body had died. Now, I don't know about you, uh, when I was a kid, for part of my childhood, we had a graveyard not, not too far from my house where I grew up. And this was when I was pretty young, and I was terrified. I wouldn't walk in the sidewalk in front of that place, not even in broad daylight, right? I was scared. I'd heard stories. I was scared. Which doesn't really make any sense because if you're a Christian at the very least, you know that the soul immediately goes to the presence of Christ if you're a Christian, that, that it doesn't remain with the body. But nonetheless, back at the time of Jesus, there was this cultural misunderstanding. They kind of had this belief, this idea that, oh, for three days, three days that soul might still be hanging out with the body, right? And so Jesus exceeds that time period, waiting it out, so that he could dispel any idea that that was the case. That Lazarus was genuinely dead. That the soul and the spirit, they were gone. That the body, it's beyond, it's gone. There's nothing recovering it. Now, it's not hard for us to understand this part of the story intellectually, but it's hard for us to keep it before us. Look, look at verse 4, what he explains here. He says, this sickness does not lead to death. And he initially says, but it's for the glory of God. And, it, and it's the, the love of Jesus here that is at the focus. Because Jesus' love at its center, at all points, at all times, has as its supreme goal, the goal of glorifying God. In all things, at all times. That is the most important thing. And it would be so easy to, to come into the story in this part here, uh, come into this thing and, 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 and get focused on something else in some other part of the story. It would be so easy to come in and interpret what Jesus does here as being harsh almost and almost uncaring because he hears, hey, your pal's dying, and oh, now he's dead, and you didn't come, right? And he's like, oh, whatever. You know, it kind of seems almost nonchalant about it, but almost unsympathetic in a way as you read the story. But if we come to the story with the understanding that, that the most ultimate thing for Jesus at all times is to glorify God, then we begin to understand why his priority was different than what ours might have been. And if that is indeed Jesus' priority, then it should probably be ours as well. To glorify God in all things at all times. To make our relationship with Jesus first above all others. You see, Jesus teaches us to, to love differently than the world. And that is indeed an unusual love. But secondly, as you look in your notes and as you follow the story, we find an unusual joy in this story. Look at what he says in verse 15. After he said in verse 14 that Lazarus is dead, he says to the disciples, I was glad, right? Okay, huh? I was glad. I was glad for your sake that I wasn't there. It's like, again, Jesus, this doesn't, from, from like a marketing standpoint, this doesn't come off as uh, loving here so much, Jesus. It's like, you were glad you weren't there. I mean, usually when somebody we're close to or we, was going to pass away, we were like, oh, I wanted to be there. I wanted one last chance to talk with them. I want to say goodbye. And Jesus is like, nah, I'm glad I wasn't there for your sake, right? It's like, what is up with Jesus today? He's just... A little weird, it sounds like, almost. You know, like something's happened. And he says, I'm glad I wasn't there. 
Normally we have this overwhelming sense, this want, this desire to be with those we love. And, and he responds so differently. But let's go back a little bit. When Jesus says in verse 7, he says, let's go to Judea again, after he's waited for those two days. The disciples are, are horrified, because that's, as I mentioned, where there were people who were trying to kill him. Back, you know, we want to go, what, Jesus? Like, they were trying to stone you, and you want to go back there? Like, every answer you've given us today. You're not in a hurry to get back to your friend. Now you're happy that you weren't there when he died, and you want to go back to where these people wanted to stone you? Like, what is, what did you eat? You know, it's like, something weird is going on with Jesus today. They're, they have to be thinking. And, and he's like, are there not 12 hours of daylight? In other words, there's no reason for Jesus to skulk around like a criminal. He's going to do his work no matter what. He's going to do his work in the daylight, and, and there's no stopping him. Even his, his own death wasn't something that, that Jesus was going to live in fear of. His life was in the hands of God, and his trust was in the hands of God. and He trusted in the providence of God, and he knew that by, by going and, and doing it and doing it in this way, by, by stopping in this place and taking his time and all of the things that had to fall into place here, that he knew God had a bigger and a greater plan in this story. And so he says, I'm glad that I wasn't there, that you might believe. So that you might come to believe is actually the wording that he uses. And it's an interesting usage of that phrase, that you might come to believe. Now, they were already believers in a sense. They were Jesus' disciples, right? But Jesus is saying, I want you to believe more. I want you to believe more deeply. I want you to have more faith in who I am and who God created me to be. So Jesus is like, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you will grow in your depth and knowledge and love and understanding of who I am as God, as man. He wanted them to grow in their beliefs. He wanted the, the disciples to grow from uh, a weak and, and shaky faith to something strong because he knows what's coming in the next portion of his days. Now as I read this story and as I read and look through it and I think about it. There's, there's always kind of an Eeyore in every story, right? You know Eeyore the donkey and Chris, you know, Winnie the Pooh, Christopher Robbins. Uh, I used to have a truck I named Eeyore. Uh, when I first started working here, I had that gray Ford Ranger. Its name was Eeyore um, because it was, it was a sad truck. Oh my goodness. Um, so I named my truck Eeyore. But anyhow, um, we, we, we get to this part of the passage where it starts talking about Thomas, right? And this is Doubting Thomas. It says he's the twin. His brother's name is Didymus. And, and, and he's called Doubting Thomas. And he gets a lot of bad press, doesn't he? I mean, everybody, you don't want to be called a Doubting Thomas. And, and he, he's the one that, after the resurrection, he's like, well, I'm not going to believe until I like, put my finger in his side and poke my finger through the hole in his hands, right? But look at what he says in verse 16. There's a very interesting little note of what Thomas says here. Jesus is like, I want to go back to this area where these people who are trying to kill me live. And Thomas was like, all righty, let's go with him that we might die. Right? Which seems a little uncharacteristic if you know the Doubting Thomas story, but that is the same guy. He's like, let's go, let's go with him. Let's go with Jesus that we might die with Lazarus because of this persecution that's undoubtedly going to come. Let's go that we might die with Jesus. And it's easy in that to see his pessimism, but again, I think there's something really, really outstanding there about Thomas, the faith that he has. He's like, well, if that's where Jesus is going to go and he's going to die, well, I, I want to be there and I guess I'll die with him. He's, he's committed. He's, he's, he's ready to go, right? He's got some bravery, maybe stupid bravery, but he's got some bravery at the very least. Um, and he's got some courage, and he's committed to this discipleship with Jesus. And so he's saying effectively to his brothers, and because the other guys were like, what's going on with Jesus? Jesus, are you sure you want to go back there because they're going to stone you? And Thomas is like, suck it up, guys. Let's go with him. And if it means we die, at least we go down in flames with Jesus, right? Now, if you don't know the backstory of Thomas, and if you, if you don't know the backstory of all of Jesus' disciples save for one, they all died horrific, horrible, terrible deaths of martyrs, right? And tradition tells us that Thomas went 
as far away as India before he died. And there's a place in Madras in India that, that uh, actually really near their airport, apparently. I've seen pictures of it. I've never been there. But there's a place there where it said you can go and you can go to what they believe is the grave of Thomas. And there's like, you know, placard and it talks about his martyrdom. And, and it said that he died in the name of Jesus as a spear was thrust through his side as he was presenting the gospel. That's the Thomas that was doubting Thomas. When Jesus gets to Bethany in the story here, he finds this scene of sadness, right? Lazarus has been dead for four days. People have come out from Jerusalem. Some of them, if you don't know, again, the culture, there were people who were professional mourners. Like, you could actually hire people to come and wail and mourn so that it, you know, really, really amped up the loss feeling, which sounds kind of weird, but... Um, we, we kind of have the opposite of this in America. If you've ever been to New Orleans, like you can hire a brass band to come dancing and marching as you walk your casket down the street, right? And, and that's like part of the culture in New Orleans, like big brass bands, and the bigger the band, like the more celebrated you are. And, and this is kind of the opposite of that, but you, you could hire people that would come out. So there's, there's people wailing and mourning, and you know they're all probably dressed like in black. I don't know what they wore back then, but sackcloth and ashes or whatever it was. And, and, and there's all this going on, and, and Martha comes out, and she meets Jesus, right? And she says to him, if you had been there, right, he wouldn't have died. Why didn't you come? Where have you been? True, she goes on to say, even now, right? So she hasn't lost faith in Jesus, but she's like, if you were here, man, oh, if you were here, he, he'd still be alive. And I'm sure she's heartbroken. And just for a moment, for a fleeting moment, it's almost as if she kind of allows her thought to go there, but she doesn't pursue it. Like, you could have saved him, but you didn't. And then she kind of steps it back, and she's like, but even now. So, so it's an interesting conversation she has with him. And then Jesus engages with her, and he says, hold on. Your brother will rise. Well, at that point, she launches forth with kind of this, this vibrant confession. She's like, oh yeah, I, I believe he's going to rise. He's going to rise at the end of the age and all of this. And, and uh, she believed in the resurrection. This is an Old Testament belief. Yes, they, they believed in an eventual coming resurrection at this time, but not quite the same as we believe today, of course, with the resurrection with Jesus. But she's like, oh yeah, I, I believe that he'll be raised. But that's, that's not what Jesus is talking about. That's what's unusual in this story. And the way that Jesus now engages with her in this conversation about the resurrection is, is he draws out of her, in, in verse 27, this, this marvelous confession. She's like, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. I have believed that you are the Christ, right? I have believed that you are the Son of God, that even you are he who comes into this world. Because... He has just recently said that he is the resurrection and life, right? And that anybody who believes in him is not going to die, but indeed shall live. So as we work through this and we hear, you know, her saying, I believe, but then we hear the disciples saying, well, why are we going in this direction? And then we hear Jesus saying, I'm glad I wasn't there. There's all kinds of like mixed messages and interesting kind of drama going on here in this story. And we find at this part of the passage this unusual joy I was talking about. And I can put it more simply like this. That Jesus' joy is the sort that knows what is better for us. See, there was all these questions going on. Jesus, you know where you're going? Jesus, why are you staying here? Jesus, why weren't you here? And I can imagine... Mary and Martha having just lost their brother, right? Wondering, for two days at least, does Jesus really even care about us? I mean, he said he liked us, he said he was our friend, but everybody else is here, and where is Jesus? The only answer that, that comes to me as I was thinking about this this week, that, that Jesus knows what is best for me, comes from uh, a lady many of you know, as Johnny Erickson Tata, right? You know her? Her story of being paralyzed, she, she'd jump into a swimming pool when she was a young girl and 
hit the bottom and has spent her whole life paralyzed. And her favorite verse in all of the Bible, she says, is Philippians 3.10, where it says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And you can understand why why Johnny might like that verse, because at the resurrection, of course, she's not going to have this body that doesn't function properly. She's going to be renewed and refreshed and able to sing and dance and jump and dive into swimming pools again if she wants to or whatever it might be. And that's her, her prayer and that's her favorite verse, that she wants to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. But then what comes with that also, though, is we have fellowship in his suffering. It's not just the good that comes with it. It's also those things that have a cost, that have a price. And in suffering, we learn some things about ourselves. And in suffering, we learn some things about our relationship with Christ. In suffering, we learn to die to our worry. We learn to die to our fears. We die to our grumbling about the inconveniences of whatever we might be going through. Because if and when we are suffering with Christ, we see there's so much more in store. And there's a a bigger plan behind it. And so Jesus says to her, I'm glad I wasn't there. And she wasn't quite ready for that, or his guys weren't quite ready for that, I guess. Actually, it wasn't her, it was the guys. They weren't quite ready for that. They didn't understand it. They didn't have a way to grasp that because they weren't thinking about the big picture of what Jesus had in store. And Jesus is like, I'm glad I wasn't there because what this is going to do is give me an opportunity to show you something that is so much better. If I was there and I saved him from dying, you'd be like, all right, yeah, cool, Lazarus is alive. But now, something great is about to happen. And so we have to put our hope and trust in Jesus as he works in our lives in sometimes ways and forms that are unusual and unexpected, not in our timeline, not as we would like him to do it. But we have to believe that he has a greater plan in store for us. Maybe, maybe even today, you struggle with something. Maybe today, whatever it might be, is, is a challenge a circumstance in your life that you're going, yeah, Jesus, if you were just here today, it wouldn't be like this. Jesus, if you would have just shown up. Jesus, if you would have just fixed this. Jesus, if you would have just given me this. Jesus, if you would have fixed this relationship. Jesus, if you would have been here for that, then it would have been better. But know that Jesus' timing is perfect. That his plan is greater. And then as we go through that process of suffering as we are faithful in it, as we keep our eyes on the cross, as we keep following Jesus, as we keep putting our trust in Him despite it maybe not being the way that we were hoping, wanting, or expecting it to be. As we keep forging ahead with Christ, know that He has something better in store for us. That God has ordered our circumstances, that He has put them together in such a way That his plan is greater. That he has an idea that will bring us unusual joy. But we have to wait for it. And the third thing, as we see in the story, is an unusual sympathy from Jesus. Now it would be easy to conclude, as I said, that he's almost a little bit heartless in the story. Until you get to verse 33, right? And this is one... Many, many funerals you've probably been to have referenced it, of course. When Jesus sees her weeping, Mary, she's come out of the house finally. There's a trail of mourners following her, and Jesus sees her. He's deeply moved. And the Bible gives us the shortest passage in all of Scripture, and it simply says that Jesus wept. That the Son of God, that God incarnate, God in flesh, shed tears when he sees, when he experiences these people mourning. The Lord of glory, the only begotten Son, the the creator of all of the universe, right? He sees this woman and these people and he weeps. Perhaps it was just the sight of Mary alone or 
this convulsive weeping of this whole group or whatever, we don't know. I think Jesus is weeping is not because his friend is gone. Jesus already has that under control. He has a plan. I think that Jesus, as he weeps here, is angry at death. He's angered at what sin has brought into this world and the pain and suffering that it causes. Then Jesus wept. I think it disturbs him inside to see the visceral response of these people to the suffering of loss from sin. It's the king of terrors, as the book of Job refers to it, that is death. And it comes as a destructive force. So Jesus is deeply moved by it, troubled by it. And he begins to shed his own tears. And he says, where have you laid him? Where is Lazarus at? He's over here. Point to the rock tomb, of course. He says, okay, move the rock. And I, and I, I love the King James Version of this because I've referenced this before. But in the King James Version, she's like, hey, Jesus, he stinketh. If we roll that rock away, he's been in there for four days. There's going to be a funk. There's going to be an odor. And we live in a rural area. There's dead animals. We know what that smells like. So she's like, I don't think we want to do that. Jesus is like, roll it away. She's like, four days, Jesus. Decomposition. Roll it away. And you understand how important these words are here. This isn't just a simple resuscitation at the ER, right? They come in, and they're like, paddles clear, zap, and your heart comes back, right? It's not like that scenario. Four days. Four long days in the tomb. Four days dead. So long that even they didn't think that the soul was there, the spirit was there. Four days. Four days in a Mediterranean climate. Four days in a warm hole in the ground. Four days. He's totally completely dead. And Jesus says, roll back the rock, and he bows his head in prayer. He lifts him up to his Father in heaven and says, Lazarus, come out. In fact, he says it in a loud voice. Not because I think Lazarus couldn't hear. Lazarus was coming out whenever Jesus said to come. He says it loudly so everyone else can hear that they might have faith. Because remember, he is glorifying God here. Lazarus, come out. Now as we hear this story, we don't have a, a category to process this. Of all the, all the great miracles that Jesus performs, water into wine, wow, that was pretty cool, right? Jesus walked on water, awesome. Feeding of the, you know, thousands of people with a kid's sack lunch. Pretty cool trick. But if you're standing there that day and you know this guy's been dead for four days and Jesus says, Lazarus, come out. And the dude walks out and he's bound, hands and feet with cloth and linen. You're like, oh my goodness. I have seen the most amazing thing today. Tomorrow when I get to work, I will have the best story of what happened this weekend, right? And Lazarus comes forth. Now this is a sign of what Jesus is going to do in, in times to come, at the end of the age when all will raise from death. But Jesus responds to us in amazing and unexpected ways. Let me close with this thought. If you're following, notice how the story ends. Lazarus lives, right? He walks out of the tomb. Jesus is like, yeah, get the, get the grave claws off of him. And we know Lazarus lives for many years to come. So you might think, because of that, there would be a bunch of mentions of Lazarus down the road. There would be some stories related to Lazarus, right? Pfft, nothing else. It's like, Lazarus, come out. And then the Bible's done with the guy. Now, if that happened today, right? 
I, I was in the Middle East, and I went to a stone tomb, and I rolled back a rock, and there's a bunch of people there mourning, and I said, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus comes walking out. I guarantee CNN, Fox News, every newspaper, every, every syndicated news anything across the world, Al Jazeera, all of them, would want an interview with Lazarus, right? He would be on network news for the next 24 hours. Yet, he disappears into the annals of history. Why is that? Why do we not hear more about Lazarus? There's a reason for this. John quits talking about Lazarus here because Lazarus wasn't the point of the story. John wants our focus to be on Jesus, not on Lazarus. The only person John wants you to see in this story is Jesus, on his power and on how he brings glory to God. John is writing Lazarus out of the story so that we too would focus on what matters most. The hero of the story is Jesus. Let that always be your focus, bringing glory to God. Keep your focus on what matters. Focus on Jesus. Let's pray.